heard me throw on terms like likelihood of confusion during these vlogs. So how exactly do you define what likelihood of confusion is? The federal appeals courts in the United States have created legal tests related to likelihood of confusion. The United States is split into what's known as circuits, and Ohio, Michigan, Tennessee, and Kentucky make up what's known as the Sixth Circuit. So we'll discuss a Sixth Circuit likelihood of confusion test that is similar to the other appeals courts tests. In a case known as Frisch's, there are eight elements the Sixth Circuit will consider to determine whether there is a likelihood of confusion. Number one, the strength of the plaintiff's mark. If there's a well-established mark like Nike for shoes or the golden arches for fast food, this factor will probably weigh in favor of that established mark. Element two, relatedness of the products. If one of the parties is selling shoes with the mark and somebody else uses the mark to sell clothing, those are probably similar products. However, Selling handkerchiefs is probably not a similar product to beverages, as Ed Timberlake reminded me on Twitter. Element three, similarity of the marks. This element considers the competing marks themselves to see whether they are similar. Element four, evidence of actual confusion. This is not necessary, but it's helpful to provide evidence that consumers are actually confused. This happened when Crocs sued Daiso in Northern District of California in June of 2022 to alleged trademark infringement. Crocs added screenshots to its complaint of consumers tweeting things like, got Crocs at Dezo and they suck, or absolutely obsessed with the $3 Crocs I got at Dezo, and apparently Dezo sells Crocs. Element five, plaintiff's marketing channels. This element may be a bit less important since almost everybody is selling goods or services over the internet these days. But let's say one company sells goods only through mail order catalogs and another company sells them only at trade shows. They could argue that these are different marketing channels that will not overlap. Element six, likely degree of purchaser care. This element could be important for high-end products such as vehicles or jewelry. The thought is consumers will spend more time looking into their purchases when they're spending more money. However, I don't think any party would argue that their consumers are not sophisticated and have no care. Element seven, defendant's intent in selecting the mark. If the plaintiff can show that the defendant intentionally selected a mark to ride the coattails of the plaintiff's mark, that would be a factor against the defendant. Element eight, the probability that the product lines will expand. One could argue that if I'm selling books, I'm likely not going to start selling computers, but again, it's a difficult argument to make now that almost anybody can sell almost anything on the internet. The Sixth Circuit has held that each case is unique, so not all the factors will be helpful. Further, there is no designated balancing formula for the factors. Their enumeration is meant merely to indicate the need for weighted evaluation of the pertinent factors in arriving at the legal conclusion of confusion. In other words, the factors that are considered and the factors that are most important will depend on the case's facts. If you get a likelihood of confusion office action, the examiner will typically cite a case to say that the two key considerations are similarities between the marks and relatedness of goods and or services. I talked about a few cases in this video and you can find the citations in the description below. So there you have it. The definition of likelihood of confusion is clear as mud. This is another reason you'll need a trademark lawyer to assist you in advising you on the likelihood of confusion. Because to your trademark attorney, trademarks are fun.